The title to my sermon this morning is An Oxymoron. That's not the title, but that's what the title is, if you know what I mean. Are you familiar with oxymorons? An oxymoron is when you take two words and put them together, and they seem contradictory at first, but they really kind of make sense. And we use oxymorons every day, and we don't even think about it. Let me share a few with you this morning to give you the idea. Freezer burn. Does that make sense? Kind of, we know what it is, right? But those are two contradictory terms. That's an oxymoron. Good grief. Any such thing? Black light. Soft rock. Civil war. More perfect. Peace force. Plastic glasses. <laughs> Diet ice cream. Pretty ugly. And the list goes on and on and on. Organized government. That's another one. Probably the most significant oxymoron in the Bible is pregnant virgin. Doesn't make sense, does it? but it's absolutely true. It's not my subject this morning, but uh, the incarnation of Christ is an oxymoron that we are going to study for all eternity and never really understand it fully. When we talk about oxymorons, we kind of chuckle, don't we? And yet, the subject this morning is really not a laughing matter. It's very serious. The title to my sermon this morning is Friendly Fire. Friendly Fire is a term that the military uses that refers to forces on one side that are attacked by their own. This usually happens by accident, but sometimes it's deliberate. And when it's deliberate, it's called fratricide. That means killing your brother. We had an example of that just after the war in Iraq began. If you remember, one of the American soldiers, as it turns out, was a Muslim and sympathetic to the cause of the opposite side. And he threw a hand grenade into a tent and killed his commanding officer. Fratricide. The Pentagon estimates that U.S. friendly fire accounted for 21,000 deaths in World War II. That's 16 percent of all the American soldiers that were killed during that time were killed by friendly fire. The Vietnam War had 8,000 deaths from friendly fire. That was 14 percent of all the American deaths over there. The Gulf War. There were only 35 American lives lost by friendly fire. And that doesn't sound like very many, but when you consider that that was 24% of the total deaths by Americans from friendly fire, it's pretty high. All too often, when we're listening to the news, we hear words like these. Soldiers were killed today in what appears to be an act of friendly fire. The heart-wrenching truth is that these soldiers were killed by their own troops. Deadly fire came upon them from somebody they trusted. Somebody that was supposed to be looking out for their best interest. Do you see the parallel? Do I have to draw the parallel here? Spiritually speaking, the number shot down within the church by friendly fire, by their own brethren, cannot be numbered for multitude. Killed by friendly fire. Friendly fire is just all too common in the church today, and anything larger than zero is a lot, 
isn't it? Can anyone put an estimate on the loss of even one soul? Actually, we can. All we have to do is look at the cross of Calvary, don't we? Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. He paid an infinite price for every person that was born into this world. The sad part is, too few will accept it. But there are some out there who will accept it. And it's our job to find those people. And then once we have found them, it's God's plan that they will not become casualties of friendly fire once they become a part of the church. What I'd like to do this morning is look at several categories that will help us to keep from, number one, killing our own, and number two, killing those who will potentially be our own, and number three, that we might learn how not to become victims of friendly fire ourselves. What I'd like to focus on is different types of judging mentioned in the Bible. And where I would like to start is the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 24. John 7, 24. John 7, 24. Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. To judge one by the way they look is an easy thing to do, isn't it? Most of us do it all the time. But the Bible says not to do that. If judging by appearance is wrong, then righteous judgment must have something to do with what's on the inside. Go to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. And beginning with verse 18. The Lord is giving instruction to Moses here. And verse 18, he says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with what? Just judgment or righteous judgment, just like we read in John 7, 24. Thou shalt not rest judgment. We are not to twist or distort or pervert the facts, but give it just like it is. Thou shalt not respect persons. We are not to give one person special treatment over another. Jesus said, ye are all brethren. We are all equal. Neither take a gift or a bribe. Now, if someone was a big donor to my ministry in the past, and they become involved in some kind of sin, am I supposed to just close my eyes and pretend that everything's okay and nothing's afraid maybe that he will not continue to support the ministry if I stand up against what the problem is? No. How about someone having a position in the church. Are we to kind of be fearful that if they pull away their support, if their sin is pointed out or something like that? No. No, this is kind of in the same category here. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And so if we're going to inherit the earth made new, we must judge righteous judgment. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel sixteen. The prophet uh, Samuel had been ordered by the Lord to find a replacement for King Saul. And he, was, he started looking over the sons of Jesse. Chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed 
is before him. Oh, this guy is so handsome, so tall, so talented. Surely this is the one the Lord has chosen. Have you ever been impressed that a certain person would make a better Christian than somebody else? I have to tell you a story. When I was in Arizona, I was in the carpet cleaning business. And uh, I met someone who was in the carpet laying business. And he referred work to me. I referred work to him. And right from the start, I said to myself, this guy would make a wonderful Christian. And I worked for Mike, and I worked for Mike, and I studied with him, and I talked to him about spiritual things. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't become a Christian at all. And at the same time, there was another fellow. You know, I thought, well, this guy, you know, nothing's ever going to come of this one. He's kind of of no account here. And guess what? He is the one who became the Christian through someone else's efforts and became a worker for the Lord. You know, those kinds of things happen all the time. First impressions sometimes are not what they appear to be. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Not long after I became a Christian, I started attending a church in East Oakland, California. And my first wife and I came to church dressed very plainly. Levi's, T-shirt, that was what I wore. My best Levi's, best T-shirt. My wife wore a pair of slacks and a blouse. She was still smoking. And guess what? Not one of the people in that church tried to correct us because of the way we appeared. And I am really thankful for that because I am from the southwest suburbs of Chicago. And nobody tells me what I should and shouldn't do. You know, that <laughs> was my attitude. Because if anyone would have said, don't you have something better to wear to church than Levi's? Don't you know you're not supposed to be wearing that gold? Don't you know what the Bible says about gold? And if anybody would have said, you know, your wife, she's still smoky. Doesn't she realize, you know, that she shouldn't do that? If anybody would have said anything like that, we would have been out of there. And I would definitely not be standing in this pulpit today. I don't know where I'd be today. Probably did the way I was going. By the way, this uh, text here, a man, the man looketh upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart, is very good counsel for young people who are looking for somebody to spend their life with. Uh, looks should have nothing whatsoever to do with our choice of a life companion. What should be the choice that we're looking for? Character. Now, everybody has a character. What kind of character? We're looking for a Christ-like character, aren't we? Have you ever noticed how beautiful people can become really ugly and plain-looking people can become really beautiful the more you get to know them? When Cindy and I were going to a little home church in Oregon before we moved up here to Idaho, there was a certain lady that was attending church. I'm going to call this person Jane. I don't want to tell what her real name was. But Jane, she was about to be married. And all she could talk about was how handsome this guy was that she was going to marry. On and on and on she went. Talk about love sick sentimentalism. And I can remember saying to Jane, Jane, our appearance should have nothing to do with our choice of a life companion. And she didn't. I mean, she heard me, but she wasn't listening. And she just went on and on, you know. <laughs> and guess what? She got married. 
and it wasn't very long until I was talking to her again at church one day about how unhappy she was. And I said, Jane, do you remember <laughs> what I told you? And I repeated again. And she didn't remember. In fact, she says, now you tell me. And I said, well, I told you before, but you weren't listening. You weren't listening. You know, if we accustom ourselves to look upon the heart as God does, we're going to choose as God would choose. Don't you think? At least in that area of our lives. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'd like to look at this whole chapter. We're going to go through it rather quickly because I want to get the context because there's a really important point in this chapter dealing with judging. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, right there at the beginning, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit, or with the judgment that I've already expressed, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What should we do if somebody in this church is a member here and involved with this kind of sin. Disfellowshipping is what has to happen. That is the way we give them to Satan. We have to disfellowship. That the spirit or the intelligent part of our being that makes the decisions that forms our character may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so when a person um, leaves Christ and becomes connected to Satan, the church must acknowledge that by disfellowshipping that person. Otherwise, the whole church becomes guilty because of that person's sin. And secondly, it's for the purpose of giving that person a wake-up call that they will return to the Lord through repentance and be saved in the end. That's the purpose of it. The purpose of that kind of action is always reconciliation. That's the way it has to be. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. The Corinthian church was really a Laodicean church. That's what it was. Their attitude was evidence that they were spiritually blind. They had this going on right in their midst, and they didn't do anything about it. They were sleepy. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven or a little sin leaveneth the whole lump. There's corporate accountability again right there, isn't it? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And so if we are in Christ, the destroying angel is going to pass over us, just like the destroying angel passed over the faithful Israelites. And what was one thing that all the Israelites were to do before the Passover? They were to put all leaven out of their house, right? And so similarly, we are to put all sin away because Christ our Passover is crucified for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. What feast? Passover. The Passover is the only feast that transfers from Old to New, New Testament. The Passover has become the Lord's Supper for Christians today. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with old sin, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornication. 
Now listen closely to this next verse, or the next couple. So he already wrote to them before not to keep company with those who are involved with fornication. Then in verse 10, he says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. You can't get away from it, can you? So Paul is making a distinction here between Christians and non-Christians, isn't he? That's what he's doing. We can associate with sinners who are involved with these kinds of things. Otherwise, how are they ever going to know the truth? But to associate with church members that ought to know better is a completely different story. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. Disassociate yourself from that person if they are a brother and are doing these things or a church. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do we have any business judging those who are not members of the church? Absolutely not. We have no authority over them. Do not ye judge them that are within. That's the job of the church, to judge those who are within the church. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And so if somebody comes in here that does not do like we do or does not believe like we believe or does not live like we live, what are we to do? Keep our lip zipped as far as their sin is concerned because we are not to judge them, are we? How in the world are we ever going to bring people in from the world if the moment they walk in the door we pounce upon them? You know, telling them all their problems and what they need to be doing. That's not our job. God judges that. Go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 13. For he, God, shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. So this is a principle that's all through the Bible. You find it everywhere. If we fail to show mercy, we shall not receive mercy. And mercy, it says, rejoiceth against judgment. In other words, a merciful man can face the judgment of God without fear because he knows that he will be treated mercifully in return for being merciful. Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 36. Luke 6, 36. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Are you familiar with uh, verse 17 says? John three sixteen. you know what it is? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For he came not into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Now if Jesus didn't condemn, do we have any right to condemn? No, he is our example. Condemn not that ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So how careful should we be when we're dealing with saints and sinners alike? Go just to the next chapter, Luke chapter 7 and verse 33. You know, some people are never happy unless they're complaining. Have you known anybody like that? I hope that does not fit your character. 
It wasn't any different when Jesus was here. In verse 33, Jesus said, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and of sinners. Now these people could not be satisfied. Either way, they complained, didn't they? You know, since I've been in the ministry, I've noticed that people are quick to complain, quick to judge when things are not done the way they think they should be done, and very quick to make you an offender for a word, but never any approbation. We send out lots of audio tapes, lots of literature, and some people that we hardly ever hear from guess what, if I slip up and say something that I shouldn't have said, or maybe I thought I said one thing and, you know, how that goes sometimes, or maybe they don't agree with something, boy, they're right on the phone. And that's all I ever hear from those people. Complain, complain, complain. Proverbs 17, Proverbs 17, verse 9. He that covereth a transgression by not blabbing it to others seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. And isn't that true? If we repeat the sins of others, we make enemies very quickly. Very quickly. But how are we to deal with sin in a brother or a sister? Aren't we given some counsel in Matthew 18? What is the very first thing we're to do? Go to that person that has a fault and make it between thee and him alone, it says. And it says here, don't repeat the matter. Go directly to that person. And if we will follow that counsel, most of the time, steps two and three are not necessary. Titus. Titus chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Paul here is telling Titus what to teach and what not to teach. And in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And what's the next line? To speak evil of no man, Christian or non-Christian. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And here's the reason why, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So what business do we have to jump on somebody else that's doing the same thing we did in the past? We need to be very careful. Remember what Jesus said about Mary Magdalene? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And he also said of her, she loved much because she was forgiven much. We've all been forgiven much, haven't we? So we need to start acting like it and love rather than condemn. Galatians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Galatians chapter 5, 14 and 15. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Boy, if we just took that one to heart, we would probably not say a lot of things we've said in the past. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Good advice, isn't it? How do we follow it? Well, it tells us in the next verse. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. 
if our behavior is in harmony with the fruits of the Spirit, as is mentioned later on in that chapter, we will not bite and devour one another. We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, as is also recorded there. Down in, in chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, what does that tell us? When you read something, it also tells you the opposite side of it, doesn't it? Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. If you are not spiritual, you better keep your mouth closed, right? If you can't go to a person that's in sin or has a fault out of love in the heart, coming to the point where we would give up our own life so that that person could be saved in God's kingdom, we better not go. And most of the time, we probably wouldn't go, would we? Sounds to me like we have a duty toward those who have fallen away from the truth. Not to condemn, but to draw them back to Christ. Verse 2 there of chapter 6 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law. Second Thessalonians. Chapter 3. Verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, quit associating with him, that he may be, what? Ashamed. That's the purpose for it, that he might be ashamed because of the way he's acting or because of what he's doing. Yet, it says, count him not as an enemy, but admonish or warn him as a brother. So again, the reason for this kind of behavior is not so that we can have a better than thou attitude, but not like the Pharisees, but uh, for the purpose of reconciliation. That's always the reason for actions by the church of that nature. Back to the book of James, chapter 5. Last two verses in that chapter. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, eternal death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. You know, in uh, Micah chapter 7, verse 19, I'm not going to turn to it, but it says there that when we return to God, he will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will subdue and cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's pretty far, isn't it? Being a tool in God's hand to hide a multitude of sins is much better than being a tool of the devil and cause discord and division among brethren. Go to Acts, Acts chapter 9, and uh, beginning with the first verse of that chapter. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, those who are found walking even as Jesus walked, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The way we treat one another is the way we are treating Jesus. It's a pretty solemn thought, isn't it? 
In the 25th chapter of Matthew, Jesus speaks of those who are strangers, those who are in need of clothing, those who are sick, and those who are in prison. And you know what he says? Verily, verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Are Christians and non-Christians alike safe within our midst? Or will they be casualties of friendly fire? Zechariah prophesied of Jesus in chapter 13, in verse 6 of the book that bears his name. That was our scripture reading this morning, where it says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus was a casualty of friendly fire, wasn't he? Killed by his own. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. They shot him down, not realizing who he was. Remember when he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's make sure that the weapons of our warfare are turned upon the real enemy before we dare to pull the trigger. Let's have zero casualties from friendly fire. Let's love people into the truth and let God do the changing in his time and in his way. Let's kneel for prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we humbly bow before you this Sabbath day. We thank you that you have led each one of us here today. We are here because you want us here for whatever reason, to fellowship, to worship you, to hear instruction, to uh, perhaps have some of our character defects exposed so that through the power of your spirit, you can change our lives. Lord, we pray for forgiveness for those times in the past when we have been guilty of killing one of our own. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be a loving church, that we would accept people that come here as they are. Jesus accepts us as we are. If we're going to be like him, we'll do the same. Not condemning, but accepting, knowing that through association with your people, the Holy Spirit will work on their hearts. And the things that are unlovely and unchristian and evil in their lives will drop away. Help us to be that kind of a church. <coughs> help us to grow. And help us to be like a light that is set on a hill. There are people out there that would see Jesus. And I pray that they would see him through us. In Jesus' name, amen.